of the biology department at Duke University um, and the past president of the American Genetic Association and the Society for the Study of Evolution. Um, so he's here to talk to us today about the genetics of Star Trek and inheritance and mutations. So without further ado, Dr. Norman. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to come and you're all intimidating in this gigantic class. Anyway, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about genetics as it's depicted in Star Trek. How many of you have had a college level biology class? Several of you. Wow, okay. How many of you have, have had genetics in particular? Oh, a decent number, too. Okay, wow. So you guys, you come up here and get a talk on the show. <laughs> so genetics is cool in real life, right? This is a picture of my son. I still have a lot of my talks. <laughs> you guys may have seen him walking around. But what is genetics? Genetics is this code that is in literally in every single cell of your body, right? And it, and it encodes just about everything about you, at, at least at some level. It, it, it affects like your hair color, your skin color, your personality, your predisposition for diseases. It affects just so much about you. That is really enormously cool. And often, if I sit on a plane next to somebody and I tell them, "Hey, uh, what do you do?" and they say they're you know whatever it is they do, they ask me what I do, and they say, "I say I'm a geneticist." I'm like, Ooh. Here's the response. In contrast, here's genetics as depicted in Star Trek. It's not exactly the most positive impression. So we have Khan, we have these engineered superhumans, we have the augments there from Enterprise, we have uh, some people who uh, are sort of failed design su designer super babies in the, in the bottom left, or at least failed uh, enhancement. We have the super soldiers, we got the Subabon, we got genetically engineered viruses and mutations. It's really like portrayed as very ominous and intimidating. What did you say? Scary. It's scary, exactly. Now think about like how many good and bad engineers are there in Star Trek? You can think of many. How many good geneticists are there in Star Trek? There's actually one. One. But they took her away. Carol Marcus in the original Wrath of Khan was actually a geneticist. So they rebooted her and said, eh, no more of that. She's good. She has to be an engineer instead. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's so frustrating. But what I want to do today is I want to give you a general introduction to basic genetics. I know several of you in the audience have said you've had some, but I know some of you haven't. So I'll go through a couple of just basic terms and basic concepts so you understand the point. Then we're going to talk about uses of genetics both in real life and in Trek. There's a couple of specific things I want to focus on in more depth, and that's mutations, because that comes up all the time, both in the uh, X-Men sense and in a more general sense, as well as genetic engineering. At the end, I have a little segment that's from Discovery that I'm going to talk about. So I'm calling that bonus. If, if you haven't seen it, you know, plug your ears and shut your eyes or run out of the room or something like that, you can come back and see the astronaut after me. <laughs> but it's going to be in there at the, at the tail end. So also, another thing too, this is a small group. If you have a question, do this. I don't see very well. It helps me not be intimidated when I give talks so I don't wear my glasses. <laughs> if you have a question, do this. And I'm happy to stop and take questions as I go along. The talk full length is probably about 45 minutes, so we have time to take a few questions. And if it's a long answer thing, I'll say, let me come back to that at the end. Okay? All right, let's dive in. So let me give some basic genetics terms. Many of you have probably heard of uh, these terms before. So DNA, DNA is the hereditary material. It is what all life on Earth presently uses today to pass on you know, information about form and behavior and everything to the next generation. It's comprised of what's called nucleotides or bases. Those are abbreviated, there's four different flavors of those. They're abbreviated A, C, G, and T. Okay? Those come together into short segments that are called genes, right? So you hear about the gene that causes you to have red hair or something like that. There's a various example of these genes. These genes are all together on long stretches called chromosomes. This is big packages of genes, and then all the DNA instructions inside your cell is referred to as the genome. So the planetary analogy I like of this is you can think of DNA as the planets, genes as the solar system, it's an amalgamation of planets, galaxies as the chromosomes, and the universe as the genome. It's a way of sort of thinking of the different levels of these different things. Now, in terms of Star Trek, uh, we've obviously learned a lot about genetics since the original series aired. And you know, we keep learning more and more all the time. You can see this in terms of depictions of uh, genetics and genetics terms in Star Trek. So what I have here is uh, three lines. The green one, which is on the bottom, is the word genome and the number of times it's depicted in the various series. So it's original series, next generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise. I didn't put Discovery in there. There's a ton of genetics in Discovery. A lot of it really bad. Right? <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> But you can see, genome didn't really get mentioned at all in the first three series. There's one exception from TNG I'm throwing out because it was a proper noun rather than a word. But it came up in Voyager a lot in Enterprise, like 10% or so. 
Even DNA and, and genetic were barely mentioned in the original series. I mean, at the point in time the original series aired, we only knew that DNA was genetic material for about 20 years. Right? We didn't have DNA sequences for anything. There was very, very little known. So it makes sense there wasn't much there. But by next generation, Deep Space Nine Voyager, you see more and more. And Enterprise, like a quarter of the episodes had some sort of genetic stuff. That's pretty impressive. So how does this work? Well, we talk about DNA as a hereditary material of life, but DNA doesn't do the work. And this is very important for understanding how it, how it does what it does and uh, the depictions that come up in Star Trek. So DNA is, again, it's the instructions that are passed on cell to cell. But what DNA does, a big part of what it does, is it encodes for protein. And these proteins basically do the hard work. They are the, the sort of the, the people who are keeping, they're like the staff. They're going to keep everything running and doing everything perfectly. So it's the physical structure, your chemical reactions, all your enzymes, all your antibodies, all that is done by proteins. Yeah. But the DNA makes those proteins. It tells them what to do, it puts them in the right place, it makes them have the right form, etc. It's sort of the dictator or the boss of the cell. Now, all the cells in your body have mostly the same DNA sequence. It's not exactly the same, but it's mostly the cell the same. And that's because we start, all of us started as one fertilized egg. Right? We had one genome and one cell. That replicated many, many times, it's just making copies. As you'd expect, it's not 100% perfect. It's pretty darn perfect, but it's not 100% perfect. So if you were to take like, a DNA sequence from the tip of this finger and a DNA sequence from the tip of this finger, they're really similar. They're much more similar to each other than they are to any of your DNA sequences. But they're not perfectly identical. Uh, and this is just because of this sort of serial copying aspect, which actually does come up in Star Trek. Uh, now you may wonder, like, well, okay, if all the cells in your body have the same DNA, like say your heart has the same DNA as your toe, why didn't I grow a toe in the middle of my chest? Right? Why did I grow a heart? Why did I have a heart on the tip of my toe? That would be very weird. Um, there we go. And the answer to this is because different genes are turned on or off in different cells. Right? So all the same, it's the, all the same information is there, but which parts are being turned on different? How much is being turned on different too? Right? So there's going to be some genes where there's lots and lots of that protein produced in one cell. Another one, maybe a lot less or maybe none at all. So a way of thinking of this in terms of analogy is you can think of it like a book, right? The DNA is the book that's in every cell, the genes are the chapters, and then something is reading these aloud, and that's making the proteins, and how loud it's being read is the quantity of protein made. And that's often referred to as gene expression, right? So in, for example, in my heart, particular genes are being read very loudly, in my toe, those genes are not being read at all, or maybe being read very softly. And what controls how much these different genes are being read is like there's a whole bunch of stuff. Some of it is environmental, some of it's like what kind of cell it's in, some of it's based on time of day, some of it's based on gender, some of it's based on hormones. So all those things come into play. Now this sort of turning on and off of DNA does come up in Star Trek. So here's just two examples. Uh, the left one there is from Voyager, where, where uh, uh, Chakotay had something, I don't know exactly what happened to him, something happened to which made him start aging rapidly, and the doctor says his DNA segments have been hyper-stimulated somehow. Or he had the same DNA as he had before, but what's happened is his being, segments are being turned on very loudly, producing lots and lots of protein, which in this case made him age in a horrible way. In terms of uh, uh, being turned off, we have Dr. Crusher talking to Barclay saying you have one dormant gene out of 100,000. That was actually, I love this statement because, huh? Oh yeah, so I love this statement because this also reflects our understanding of genetics at the time. So this, was, this episode came out around 1990. Around 1990, we thought there were 100,000 genes. Today we know there's probably only really about 20,000 genes. But kudos to them, they were absolutely accurate for the time. So thumbs up to the scientific advisors there. Now, as I mentioned, individuals differ in their DNA sequence. Oh yeah, question, please. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, that's more depth than I was going to go into, but it's absolutely true. Although there's t there about 20, 25,000 different genes in humans, they can actually form different proteins because of exactly how they put together the proteins that's coming out. I won't go into actually splicing itself as far beyond the scope of this, but absolutely right. The individuals differ in their DNA sequence, so I, I picked uh, two fictional, one real person. The bottom one's actually real, it's my daughter Megan. But there's a fictional Tyshawn, a fictional Liliana, and this is just a, a stretch of the lactase gene. What this gene does is, it does, as it sounds, it produces an enzyme for breaking down milk sugars, so lactose. And anybody here lactose intolerant? Yeah, anybody here lactose intolerant? So Megan, in this case, here, 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 here. Megan is lactose intolerant because she has two copies of the C gene, or sorry, the C mutation in that particular spot. Um, Liliana can digest lactose just fine. Tyshawn also, actually, I forgot to mention, they all have two copies because they got one from their mom and one from their dad. Right? So what might these differences in DNA sequence do? In some cases, like in this one, this is affecting the, the, the type of, or the quantity of protein being made. 
right? Other kinds of DNA sequence differences you might see might affect the type of the protein, others may do nothing at all. In this, particular, in this particular case, it's actually very important. And Megan, as, as shown with that little arrow there, is actually lactose intolerant because she has two copies of that C uh, uh, nucleotide at that site. So I'm going to change it now from letters to just variants. This is often how we talk about genes. We talk about the context of variants, which are also called alleles, but I'll just use variants as easy to say. So Taishan has one intolerant variant and one tolerant variant. Right? Megan has two intolerant variants. Unsurprisingly, Megan is lactose intolerant. Taishan, even though he only has one copy of the, of the tolerant variant, it makes, him overall to, uh, it makes him overall tolerant. How is that? Well, let's talk first about an inheritance. As I mentioned before, you inherit one copy from each parent. So on the top is the mother, the bottom is the father. This is actually my wife and me, the, the bottom and top relative to Megan, my daughter. We actually, this is the problem about being a family of geneticists, is like you sequence your family all the time and look up things. <laughs> It was really funny sending that over to a pediatrician, like, oh, we know she's lactose intolerant. Look, here's the DNA sequence to prove it. <laughs> a little embarrassing. <laughs> but each of us, the, the mom and myself, have one copy of this tolerant variant, and we, we can just milk sugars just fine. Megan, in contrast, cannot. So what is going on here? Well, this is referred to as genetic dominance. Okay, we have one copy which basically takes over the effect from the other one. And in general, there's many variants out there which require only one copy to manifest. And here's a, here's a trick example. There's John Torres, his Bolana's father. He obviously has two smooth copies. So let's imagine in this case the forehead is controlled by a single gene, John is not. But let's imagine it was controlled by a single gene. John has two copies of smooth, so he's human, he's pure human. Neral, his, or her mother, has two copies of rigid. Bolana has one smooth, one rigid. So which one is dominant, smooth or rigid? Rigid is dominant. One copy is enough to manifest. So you can say that's, that's dominant. So, yes, Ridgey is called dominant because one is enough to manifest. Well, looking further, it's nice that we have a whole pedigree here in Star Trek. Yes. So here's Bolano with one copy of smooth and one Ridgey, Tom with two smooth. And we don't actually know what's going to happen in this case. Well, we do because we saw the kid. But in theory, we didn't know what's going to happen in this case because Bolana could contribute the smooth variant to her kid or she could contribute the Ridgey variant to her kid. Tom's always going to contribute smooth. So there's basically a 50 50 chance of being Ridgey, completely determined by the mother's egg. It has nothing to do with anything Tom Paris has contributed. In this particular case, young girl actually got one smooth and one rigid, so she, see, she has that there. She has the ridges there. Now, this is the clip that maybe came in earlier. You heard me playing it. This was actually depicted correctly in Star Trek. <laughs> oh, she's beautiful. Forehead ridges. Yes. But she's only one quarter Klingon. Klingon traits remain dominant for several generations, even with a single ancestor. Oh, she looks just like her mother. She doesn't look very happy about that, but we'll that part. <laughs> what I like about this is, and the exact verbiage there isn't very precise, but that, that's okay. What I like about this is this idea that, yes, Ridgey is dominant, and it can actually last for several generations. Now, what we see here is Molana and Moral Paris both actually have exactly the same complement of, of, uh, of variants there, like one smooth, one rigid. So if Moral was to have a kid with Harry Kim or whoever, right? <laughs> Not really Harry Kim, but <laughs> still, yeah, it's, it's still probably 50% she's going to pass that on. So in that sense, it does stay dominant over several generations. And I like that. That was a very good depiction within Voyager. We're going to see some less good depictions in just a moment. <laughs> so let's talk about, that's the end of our just general introduction to genetics in terms of inheritance, how it works, uh, genes, proteins, etc., and dominance. Let's talk about uses of genetics in, in real life and in trek. Now here's a couple of reasons people like to study DNA. One of them is to look at disease predisposition. And we talked about that, several of you were on my talk earlier today, we talked about that at some length in the early part, so I won't belabor that one here. It's very common for parentage or relative analysis, return region or species of descent, and of course for forensics. Lots and lots of genetic testing for forensics. And it's, it's not quite as easy as it looks in NCIS or any of those other shows. It's not quite that super fast where you pop in the machine and it's like, it's John Doe. It's not quite that extreme. But we'll come back to this. So in terms of parentage, again, there's about 3 billion of these nucleotides in your genome. You have two copies because you have one set from your mom and one set from your dad. A random person probably differs on average about one out of every thousand sites. Right? So if you were to pick me and this gentleman right here, we'd probably differ by about 1,000, maybe 899, maybe 1210, something like that. So generally speaking, random people differ 3 million sites in their genome. That's a lot of difference. That gives you a lot with which to work. Uh, differences in fewer sites indicates that you're somehow related, that you have a more recent shared ancestor. So for example, if I was to compare myself with my first cousin, 
you know, we obviously share way, way, way more sites. And you know, in terms of difference, instead of three million sites different, we might only differ at a couple of thousand sites. Right? And because of this, technology and resources are available to allow you to score a million sites very quickly, very easily, and very quickly determine uh, parents' user relative analysis. So I did this myself through a commercial company. And the commercial company then compared it to its database of other people. And what it found is this particular person who shared these stretches of DNA, these are the 23 chromosomes in humans. Uh, the purple indicates perfect match to another person. Those are areas that were perfect match between me and somebody else. And they estimated this person was probably my third cousin. I had never heard of this person before, ever. So contacted her, exchanged family trees, and guess what? She's my third cousin once removed. We were able to absolutely confirm that. So it's proof of principle right there in terms of my own family that these things actually work quite well for identifying relatives. Here's an example from Star Trek in terms of parentage and relative testing. And this is from Enterprise in this case. We also see our guest John Billingsley here in a second. They are who they claim to be. Most of the young woman's ancestors were human, but there are also chromosomes from three species I've never seen before. These genetic markers belong to you, Captain. She would appear to be your uh, great granddaughter. I've uh, compared your genetic profile with Lorian's. These base pair sequences could only have come from you. These chromosomes are human. That's correct. They uh, came from his father. Who's the father? Commander Tucker. So this was a really good example for, from several respects, right? So the Tucker to Paul aspect for immediate parentage for Lorian. Lorian was the, the guest in that episode. Uh, what about the part about Archer being the great grandfather of Karen Archer? Well, what we predict in this case, again, Archer gives half of his genes, his half, one half of his genes off to his kid. That kid gives half to their kid. That kid gives half to Karen Archer. So what Flocks probably saw was a perfect match at one eighth of sites. That's actually quite straightforward. Now, I couldn't tell from that little scan if that's exactly what he saw, but we'll just assume the best and then say that's what they actually saw there. Now, the other thing they pointed out in there very quickly is Flocks mentioned, oh, I saw bits from a couple of other species. And you think, oh yeah, right, that's not realistic. In fact, we can do this not just for other species, but also for even region of descent. This is actually now my ancestry as depicted from my genome. So this is, again, for a commercial company. It, without any information from me, said I'm 86.2% North African. My ancestry is from Egypt. My parents both immigrated here from Egypt. So dead on, right? Some Middle Eastern in there, which isn't very surprising, because lots of people come over from Saudi Arabia and other parts of the Middle East into Egypt. Tiny bits of European and very tiny bits of Sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, I know about the Sub-Saharan Africa and there's a tiny bit in there, because if you go to like my great-great-grandfather, one of them did immigrate over from Sub-Saharan Africa and Ethiopia area. So that, it's dead on right, and this is exactly the kind of thing that you can get from this genetic testing. And what about the species part? So people quickly dismiss that, but in fact, all of us, all of us here in this room, actually have bits of other species in our genome. And this is because modern humans, inter or sorry, previous ancient humans, uh, interbred with Neanderthal, and modern humans inherited some of those genes from the Neanderthal. Not very much. Typically, it's, it's on the order of like 2-3% of our genome came from ancient Neanderthals. Right? But in some people, it's up to 5%. It's much higher in, in people of European descent, because that's where the Neanderthals were, than it's in people of African or Middle Eastern descent. So those are European, you're probably a little bit more Neanderthal. Ugh. Anyway, these not even genes actually have effects. Uh, there's, these are a couple based on the based on one of the commercial sites. They, they, can, they can cause your hair to be a little more straight. You just sneeze after eating dark chocolate. It's pretty random, but <laughs> that's what they say they can do. And there's actually good mapping studies showing that less back hair height. In some cases, there's a, there's another uh, species with which uh, humans interbred called Tanisimans. In some cases, genes from these other species actually helped us adapt to our environment. In the case of the Denisovans, Tibetans, modern Tibetans, actually have some genes that came from Denisovans that help them in, in adapting to high altitude right, in terms of breathing with less oxygen there. So again, this kind of stuff does happen. And in terms of identifying species, I realize people do this all the time. These are the fruit fly species I work on. I work on two called Drosophila pseudobscura and Drosophila persimilis. Don't worry about the name. They're two species. They look absolutely exactly the same. The only way to tell them apart is to look at their genes. Yeah, you have a question? No, I'm just... Just stretching. Oh, okay. Oh, for these guys? For, uh, so it depends on the fruit fly species. So Drosophila melanogast to the standard lab fly is four. These particular ones actually are five. So it very much depends on the species you're looking at. 
Now, what about determining species in Star Trek? Well, here's a, an interesting example from several respects. This, this is Seska from Voyagers, or something made around before. What is this about? What's wrong with you? Talk to me, Chicote. You owe me that much. What would you say I owe to a Cardassian who infiltrated my crew? What are you talking about? Isn't that why you never got around to a blood analysis when we came on board? I didn't get around to it because I didn't get around to it. Turns out your blood is missing all the common Bajoran blood factors. It's a side effect of Orchid's disease. Ask your doctor. Orchid's disease? A childhood virus that swept through the Bajoran work camps during the occupation. Thousands of children didn't survive. I did. Thanks to a bone marrow transplant from a sympathetic Cartastian woman. Her name was Cattell. When we get home, you can ask her yourself. That's, that was a very, very impressive story. I was actually very impressed with that. So, Seska is saying that this, or Chakotay initially was saying her, her blood test was missing some uh, common majority blood factors. Let's assume this was DNA-based testing. We don't actually know what kind of testing they were doing. Let's assume it's DNA-based. It may not. So, she got a bone marrow transplant as a young child. Remember, bone marrow is actually what makes your red blood cells. So by getting this bone marrow transplant, in theory, from a Cardassian woman, we know this is actually what happened, but if she got this bone marrow transplant from a, from a Cardassian woman, as a Bajoran, she would have been producing uh, Cardassian red blood cells. So that was a great story. Now, the one minor hitch of that story is it's just red blood cells. There's a lot more in blood than just those red blood cells, so you would have seen the Bajoran factors in there, too, and that's probably why the doctor was like, uh, no. <laughs> But it was a really good story in that sense of coming up to it. Very creative to come in with that, uh, with that angle of the bone marrow transplant. So the last one actually I'm going to show a negative example rather than a positive example. And that's in terms of forensics and individual identification. So again, you can, you can identify who a person is quite well, or at least you know, down to identical twins or family members uh, from their genetic tests. And this is done all the time again in all these NCIS, CSI, all those sorts of shows like that. So you guys have seen these sorts of things happen. If you do the commercial kits, they either take a cheek swab or they have you spit a ton into a tube for doing that sort of thing. Now, I'm going to show you an example from the original series. So this isn't really fair, but this is a case where they wanted to see if a particular person was who they thought it was. And you might remember this. You might remember this episode. This is from Conscience of the King. So they want Kirk wanted to find out if actor Anton Caridian was Governor Kodos, who had, who had uh, slayed several people in his colony trying to keep everybody alive, or trying to keep the remaining people. So what he had to do is he said, read this little speech, and we'll do a voice print analysis and see if that's actually you. That would be terrible compared to a DNA test. I don't care how good your voice analysis thing is, that would be terrible compared to a DNA test. But it's still, again, it's not really fair because at the time, people weren't doing DNA tests. We barely worked with DNA at all in some sense, and we didn't have any DNA sequences, so it's fair. Clear cut? Yeah, exactly, even though it wasn't so clear cut. So I want to go into two things in a little bit more depth, because this is, these are things that come from a lot of sci-fi, including but not limited to Star Trek. So the first one is mutations. And mutation, oh my god, that word is used in so many different weird ways in science fiction. Let's talk about what, what mutations are. And there's two basic kinds of mutations I want to distinguish, right? So one of them is random copy errors that happen as a cell divides into two within your body. Right? So I mentioned earlier that, again, like the tip of this finger isn't necessarily exactly the same DNA sequence as the tip of this finger. And that's because of these random DNA sequence changes that happen just from replication. So if you have an original cell there, it has the two copies, AAC, CATG, AAC, ATC, one came from mom, one came from dad. Maybe mutation happened here as the big two daughter cells, where this one got substituted with a G right there. Okay? That could happen. It's pretty straightforward. And we don't know what the consequence of that is. It, it for sure results in a genetic difference among cells in your body. We have a much better appreciation that there's more of that now. Now that we have single cell genome sequencing that, uh, relative to, say, 10 years ago when we couldn't do that. Sometimes that causes cancer. It's actually a fairly common reaction, unfortunately, for some of those sorts of changes. Um, so that's one kind of mutational R4. This is just a mutation in your body. And we're going to need to distinguish these for a track example later. The other one is mutations while making gametes. These are the kind that then are passed on to your kids. So again, it's the same sort of idea with the random DNA copy errors that's making a gamete. So let's say this is me, and this is a sperm cell that I made. Here's a, here's a DNA sequence which is not actually present in any of my cells, but as it made this uh, gamete, in this case a sperm cell, it created that little, uh, that little change. 
that kind of mutation is probably the ultimate source of all variation on the planet. Because again, if there was one origin of life on Earth, which there was, that initially had presumably one DNA sequence, right? But today we have like seagulls and bacteria and all sorts of different things out there. So again, that sort of diversity happened in the context of making new organisms all the time. Again, the consequence of this is not really clear. So here's the offspring. This is from moms from dad. They may be healthier than the mom and dad. It may be the same as mom and dad. It may be worse off than mom and dad. We don't really know. All we know for sure is there's a difference in one of the gene copies relative to like parents. On average, so I say me to my kids, on average there's probably about 30 to 60 DNA sequence differences. So it's not like a small number. There's a fair number of these things that actually happen. So the punchline for all this is DNA sequence, DNA changes are random. It's not like you can plan ahead, oh, this, will, this T will change to a D. The effect is unknown. This is very important. Since this change is random, there could be no effect, improvement, or problem, and it propagates as the cell divides. We're going to go now to probably one of the worst Trek episodes ever. <laughs> this is Voyager Threshold. Actually, well, one second. One second before we go. Let me tell you what, what, was, what the context is. Tom Paris has just done the first uh, ever Warp 10 flight. Warp 10 means somehow that you're everywhere at all times at once. Then he pops back and he's okay. And then he like suddenly becomes allergic to water and dies. And then he wakes up again. That's where we take over. All of your internal organs are functioning again. In fact, you seem to have an extra one. some sort of mutation. His DNA is rewriting itself. To what end, I don't know. Does this have anything to do with the enzymatic imbalance you found? No. Can you stop it? So far, nothing has worked. The mutations are unlike anything in Starfleet medical records. His internal organs are being rearranged. Some have atrophied and been absorbed into his body. And there are at least three others that have appeared that have no identifiable function at all. Continued change as the skin goes away and he becomes sort of reptilian or amphibious or something like that. But before he goes all the way, like when he's at stage three there, I guess you could call it, he grabs Janeway, they go and warp, they go and warp ten, and she becomes one of those too. And they have babies. So like this is one of those like, oh my god, where do you start episodes? <laughs> What's that? Blue tongue skin. I actually have one of those as a pet. Those are those are less cute than my blue tongue skin. <laughs> so this is just a subset of the problem. This first, like this change was repeated in Paris and Janeway, right? How how this be repeated? Like this the same change in multiple cells of each of them, like exactly the same, so they're actually genetically compatible. But they often seem to have a goal and is unusually lucky. Like how would you get this healthy new species that's even fertile? Right? Also, the effect happened way too fast, way, way faster than cell division. Like, your heart cells do not divide fast enough for you to grow another heart anywhere near that fast. So, the most likely outcome, if there was some sort of rampant mutation, is cancer and death in a very short period of time. That's by far the most likely outcome if you have this sort of gene, not evolving into an amphibian in a repeated way. Now, there is one potential thing you could toss in there and say, well, maybe it's a little bit less absurd, only a tiny bit. A little bit less, which was slightly more likely, but still very unlikely possibility, is that it wasn't actually a change in DNA sequence. It wasn't a true mutation per se, but it may be a change in which genes are turned on or off. So there are, you know, small chemical groups which can be added to DNA, right, which, which essentially modify them and affect how much the protein is being produced. This comes in under the general umbrella of what's called epigenetics. Now, some of these can replicate across different cells and may even be hereditary in a few cases. Definitely in plants, less so in, in, in mammals. It's like a couple of loose cases of maybe to happen. But that would be a tiny bit less likely, but still how, how repeated it was and stuff, uh, that's really a stretch. Nonetheless, as many of you know, there are some scientific... Oh, yeah, question. In theory, so that's the exact, so the question was, can, can, is it possible that, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, so actually that's a very good question. 
So the question was, can an epigenetic change be induced through a retrovirus? At that point, it doesn't have to be epigenetic. It could actually be genetic. But there's no reason why going to warp 10 would necessarily introduce a retrovirus to do that. So, but yeah, I guess in, in theory, sure. <laughs> now, there's scientific results get published in scientific journals. There are a few what are referred to as predatory scientific journals out there. Some of you may have heard of these things. What they will do is basically, you send them your scientific results, you send them a check, and they will publish whatever the heck you want. And there's no real good peer review for it. And there's an interesting study in this one called the American Research Journal called Rapid Genetic and Developmental Morphological Change Following Extreme Celerity. Celerity means speed. Note the authors, Thomas Paris, Harry Kim, Bellana Torres, Kes Ocampa, I guess she doesn't have a last name, Catherine J. Wayne Lewis Zimmerman. If you read actually the results section of this paper, this actually is online. You can, you can Google this and find this. If you read the results section of the paper, it replicates everything that happens in the episode in science speak. <laughs> it is amazing. I love this. <laughs> so, I have no idea how it got there. <laughs> It actually did get two peer reviews. It was a little bizarre. They were like, you need to deposit the DNA sequences in GenBank. Like, that's the problem? Evolving <laughs> <laughs> to a lizard is not a problem, but that's the problem? Okay. <laughs> so, anyway. Last but not least, let's talk, well, actually, second to last, actually. we'll come back to the, the piece from Discovery separately. I'm not, I'm formally, I'm going to talk, and I'm going to the Discovery in case anybody doesn't want to hear it. Genetic engineering, this is something that gets talked about a lot. There's a lot of misconceptions about it. So the general idea is, this is a direct quote I think from Wikipedia, it's the deliberate modification of the characteristics of an organism by manipulating its genetic material. So traditionally what this means is that it's like when an investor goes in and targets a particular segment of DNA and alters it in a very specific way. That's usually the context in which genetic engineering is discussed. Some people, and unfortunately actually some scientists do this, talk about any modification such as including selective breeding. So would you say, for example, poodle, poodles are genetically engineered from wild dogs? I would say no, that's not genetically engineered, that was just selective breeding. But it's true that there was a sort of directionality to it and it wasn't intentionality to it, but it wasn't looking at the DNA sequence itself. So how does this work? Well, generally speaking, for the, for the real one, not the selective breeding kind, you're working with cells or embryos in a lab, you identify a particular spot in the genome, you say, I want to change this, I want to delete this bad variant and put in a good variant or something like that. You have to produce some targeting molecules and the DNA which, which you want to be there, which isn't there yet. You put the enzymes that take care of cutting out the old one and putting in a new one, and then you just keep growing what's, what's happening there. This has been very popular through a new approach, you may have seen this in the news or in Discovery Magazine, this kind of thing, CRISPR-Cas9. This is a set of molecules that are very, very, very good at this. This was just introduced within the last 10 years. They are super fast, super cheap, super reliable at doing this. So now all of a sudden, like the kind of genetic engineering that people wanted to do, which was extremely difficult even six, seven years ago, is now fast, easy, and cheap on a relative scale. Not the kind of thing you have like a ticket home, uh, home kit to do or anything like that, but any laboratory which is set up for like your can do that. Yeah? Um, how, I know you said it was relative, but when it comes to funding, I know that's always really yeah. important. How is it like order of magnitude? It's, you can do this now for a couple of thousand dollars. If you're, if you're already set up as a molecular biology lab, you, know, you can do this for a couple of thousand dollars. Which that, for a molecular biologist, that's considered kind of on the cheap end. You know, for like a home citizen scientist, that's still kind of absurd. <laughs> but anyway, it involves very few elements. And this shows, this shows a depiction of it from a magazine. Now, this has been used even in the case of human embryos fairly recently. Right? So this is, a, this is from uh, New York Times. From August 2nd of this year, science edited a dangerous mutation from genes in human embryos. There's also a more recent study where there was a child, I don't remember exactly how old they were, something like six, seven, they had a skin disease where it was very easy for their skin to just come off. Uh, what they did in this case, they didn't actually edit the child or embryo. What they did is they took a sample of skin, they pulled it off, they edited the genes in there and grew some tissue, cult basically tissue culture of this, and then placed it back on the kid. And it actually took, right, because it's based on its own genes, so it's like, it's exactly, it's a perfect match, except that the mutation is taken out. And now this kid who before had to basically live in a bubble, he's out there playing football and stuff like that. So that's just amazing, right? Now, what about Star Trek? There's an interesting case here. So when people all tend to think when you think Janky Jr., you often think of Khan, right? <laughs> well, they actually never said Khan was Jankily engineered in the first episode in space. 
Never said that. In fact, when Spock said repeal, he's the product of, quote, selective breeding. That, I thought it was very interesting. It wasn't until Wrath of Khan, until that movie came out, also the one, the one with the fake Khan, which we won't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's when all of a sudden it became this genetically engineered thing. So it's interesting when you think about either one of these, how this would have happened. So the series aired in the 1960s. Khan was supposedly, at that age, in the left, in the 1990s, right? When he took over you know, parts of Earth and things like that. So, that's one generation. <laughs> that's not a long time in there. So, for this product of selective breeding, it's kind of like that kid. That's about as much as you can do in terms of selective breeding. <laughs> there's not really much opportunity for that to happen. Now, in contrast, if you say there's an actual truly genetically engineer, they had something like CRISPR Cas9 in some secret Soviet lab or something like that and did it. That, I guess it was possible because yeah, there was a generation in there, so you could have done that. The issue there is how they would know how to do so much. Like, our knowledge of genetics is, is okay, but saying I want to give somebody superior intellect, what genes should I change to do that? Nowhere close to that. Nowhere close to that, even today. I mean, we're like 50 years later now. Nowhere close to that level. So maybe the secret Soviet lab that also had a huge body of research that could have been. Let me talk about another genetic here, the case of the Sulaban, right? So what could the Sulaban do? They had the, the subcutaneous pigment sacs so they could turn invisible, which that was kind of cool. They had their, little, their weird retinas that, I don't even remember what the retinas did, but I remember they had retinas that did something special. Um, now Phlox, interestingly said at one point, these genetic enhancements are not in their genome. So I found that very puzzling. Well then, how is it genetic? Right? So I'll come back to that in just a second. Some parts of it were reversible and can be extracted. There was a horrifying comment in Enterprise Coldfront where um, the, the, the sort of blurry guy, the sort of glory guy said, oh, now we're going to take out your advanced retinas. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, it's not something that's actually in the game. So my best guess is that he actually has genetically engineered organs, similar to the case we are talking about of the, um, the, skins, the skin that the, that the kid was given here on Earth just recently. That would actually explain the Sulaban much better than actually they were genetically engineered, in a sense they would pass it on. So in theory, if, even when these genetically engineered Sulaban had kids, their kids would just be the, the old Sulaban. They would not be these enhanced Sulaban. It still makes that whole change in the retina thing a little horrifying. So overall, what have I told you so far? Yeah, it was really good on time. Uh, general insurance, some basic genetics, uses in real life in trick, talks about mutation, talks about genetic engineering. In terms of depictions in Star Trek, genetic testing is actually done very well, especially in the later series. I mean, that obviously didn't show up in, in, in the original series. Consideration of transmission is perfect. Like, they know dominance. Dominance is actually said several times. I just gave you one example. It comes up a lot in Voyager, too. Um, genetic engineering kind of makes Genes being turned on and off comes in okay. The worst is when it talks about mutations. But this is true for all science fiction. This isn't something that's unique to Star Trek in any way, shape, or form. Now, I want to go into something. Anybody want to plug their ears or leave? You have a moment to do so. I want to go into one piece from Discovery. I'll give you 10 seconds. Yeah, you have a question? Sure. seems a little bit more radical because there's not wings and stuff like that involved, but it, that's the same sort of change. But the genes for all those things are already present. In this case, they were claiming that these mutations came externally were imposed upon the organism. So that would be the difference there. All right. I want to hit the case of the supposed horizontal gene transfer from the tardigrade from the Star Trek Discovery. So here's a very short clip. It's only 10 seconds long. It summarizes what they were saying up until this point. By the way, I'm not going to even talk about the spore drive. Like, oh my god. <laughs> Like its microscopic cousins on Earth, the tardigrade is able to incorporate foreign DNA into its own genome via horizontal gene transfer. So horizontal genes, I love that actually. I love the graphic there, the horizontal gene transfer, like the gene just coming off and going to the right. I know it's not sarcastic actually, I really do like that because it actually depicts it pretty nicely. So what is horizontal gene transfer? When I talked about inheritance before, we were talking about the context of sexually reproducing organisms like ourselves, like plants and things like that. But bacteria, bacteria don't mate with another 
the bacteria. What they do is they have this sort of horizontal gene transfer. Basically, it's just a little segment of DNA spins off their genome, goes floating off and, and into another one, and gets absorbed and, and incorporated to their genome. That is horizontal gene transfer. I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but it's basically the major mechanism of how bacteria change over genes, including genes that are associated with antibiotic resistance. This is why one bacteria having antibiotic resistance can suddenly give it to a whole bunch of others, even of different types of different species, things like that. Uh, it's very similar in process to how genetic engineering works. The same sorts of enzymes are used to break this in and put them into the genomes of the other species. That's pretty cool. There are a few confirmed cases of this in plants, <coughs> fungi, and animals. Right? So these are often the case of like bacteria in our guts, giving little bits of genes into our cells in our guts, that sort of thing. There's a few cases like that that, that have been documented in a couple of plants and animals. Now, what I'm sure they were referring to in the case of the tardigrade was this study right here. This is from 2015, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is a very reputable journal. Evidence for extensive horizontal gene transfer from the draft genome of tardigrade. So this, these researchers got the first whole genome sequence of the tardigrade, and they're like, oh my god, one-sixth of that genome came from other species. One-sixth, that's a huge fraction for an animal to have, especially from a bacteria. So this was a shocking result. And they pitched in the context of like, maybe this is how tardigrades are able to withstand, like, you know, surviving in space-like conditions and, you know, desiccation, all these things. That was very dramatic. Unfortunately, it was dead wrong. <laughs> Because the following year, there was another paper published titled, No Evidence of Extensive Horizontal Gene Transfer in the Genome of the Tardigrade, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, what happened is the original study forgot to take out bacteria that are actually in the guts of the tardigrade. So they just assembled it into, the, basically they got, they ground up the little animals and they saw genes both from bacteria and from tardigrade, but they were actually in the bacteria. They're not part of the tardigrade's genome. It's kind of like grinding yourself up and using all your own gut bacteria. Well, that's not part of you. That's just part of your gut bacteria. So it was a good attempt. At least there was some science that was based on an actual scientific publication. But in this particular case, they, they probably had already started like the scripts and stuff like that. Like, well, we're not going back. We already have the tardigrade. It's cool. <laughs> so they went with it from that. So, yeah, we're well, at 445, that's where I want to be. So I'm happy to take questions for the next few minutes before, uh, before uh, Dr. Wolf comes online. Thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah, okay, you can yell and I'll repeat the question so that people can hear me. Please, go ahead. This is Dr. Burton. Um, so, was it the genetics episode? Was your discussion about it? Yes, oh God, yes, the next generation episode Genesis, yes. <laughs> so, I'll, yeah, well, yes and no. <laughs> so let me, let, me get, let me give the background for this. So that was one of the episodes I thought about going into, but I skipped. <laughs> this, is, this, is another, this is another doozy here from next generation. So this actually goes back to the same episode I showed earlier. Where was this? This one. It goes back to this episode right here. So Barkley had this uh, dormant gene of 100,000. What happened is, Crusher is getting, Crusher's about to cause all sorts of health breakdowns here because she's getting this injection of T cells to try to help him. Somehow these T cells that, they, that she injects into Barkley makes his introns turn on. So what are introns? Introns are segments within genes that are actually turned off, right? They do not get incorporated into proteins. So supposedly what happens is when turning these on, you're getting a different kind of protein. That part is okay. What they pitched in the episode is that somehow there's a historical artifact there, like that our, all our evolutionary history is somehow preserved in these introns. And by turning them on, you will then de-evolve into these past forms. So, uh, I think Riker became a spider, uh, <laughs> or sorry, not Riker, Barkley. Barkley became a spider. Riker became some sort of primitive primate. Troy became this amphibian. Oh yeah, what was it? Uh, Spot, the cat, became like an iguana. Worf was like some ancient Klingon thing, yeah. yeah. So there's so many problems with this. So, so introns are a real thing, and that's fair. That part is good, there's nothing wrong with that. They do not preserve some sort of ancient history. Because as you can imagine, because they're not uh, affecting proteins, they change a lot. So if you look at differences between us and, say, chimpanzee, our nearest living relative, the differences in introns are much greater than they are at genes, or gene segments that make proteins because there's no constraint there. You can change it willy-nilly and there's no problem. 
So nothing would actually be preserved over millions, or in some cases billions of years of evolutionary history in these introns. The other thing about this is we have no ancestors that were spiders. We, so this is a common mistake in terms of thinking about evolution. So we think about other modern day species and we think they are our ancestors. But that's just wrong. They're kind of like our distant cousins. We didn't descend from our cousins. We share an ancestor with our cousins. We have no ancestors that were spiders. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty clear. Yeah? So uh, which of those causes multiple like, extra limbs or extra fingers to show up in some people? And why does that transfer sometimes and sometimes not? Great question. So there's a lot of different things for that. So one common thing, polydactyly is one of the most common things for having an extra finger. So you have that? Oh, fantastic. It's awesome. <laughs> so often what that is, is it's, it's something, it's basically just a developmental gene that controls the uh, divisions associated with making your uh, fingers. So it's not, it's not, in terms of whether it's genetic or not, it just depends on if it actually got into your germline. So if it happened in a cell which eventually made it to your germline, it would be in all the, all the, all the cells of your offspring. Right? Whereas in contrast, if that mutation happened, say, in your, in your leg, it would never get into the germline, it would never get passed on. Well, strangely, in my mother's family, it seems to hit every other generation. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, so every other thing comes up a lot, but I think often that's just luck. I, think, I don't think there's, I can't think of an easy genetic mechanism which would make something always turn on every, like, this generation, but then off the next generation. I mean, I can come up with a story for one, but I've never actually heard of a, a, a clear-cut case where that, that was actually genetically determined. It's usually just luck. Uh, actually, I have no question, but Please. thank you for pronouncing Neanderthal <laughs> correctly. That is one of the having having uh, had a liberal arts education and we have a and, 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 and medieval history. Just hearing that that re region of France pronounced correct no Germany Germany, yeah, Germany yep. correctly just drives me nuts, especially when it's on a history channel and it's from an academic who should. No better. No problem. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks for running those around, by the way. Um, hi there. Thank you for all of your information. Now no I have a, a basic foolish science fiction sure question. Of, um, there's so many stories with humans, with animal traits, and vice versa. You know, this is genetic sequencing and things like that. Could, you know, 300, 400 years from now, is that anything that could happen? So, uh, so we are animals. Are, you, are there a specific kind of trait you're thinking about in that context? Oh, um, I was just thinking about, uh, let, let's say, you had uh, an animal that uh, could talk. Oh, okay. Think. Okay. So is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, it may already, in some sense, exist. I mean, there's a lot of communication out there which isn't necessarily vocal in the sense we think about. I mean, you think about, like, ants and other sort of insects when they interact with each other, they exchange information as they're moving along. So there's clearly communication that happens quite a bit in the animal kingdom, outside of humans. Um, obviously, like, you know, we see things with birds, too, in terms of their bird songs, where they have specific songs for, you know, identifying territory, specific songs for tracking mates. Now, it's not as, at least as far as we know, it's not as precise as ours, where we can depict a thought where I can say, you know, upstairs and down the hall, my, my son is there playing a Nintendo, you know, that sort of level of detail, as far as we know, it does not exist. Is it in principle possible in a few million years? Absolutely. My best guess if something like that was to come out, I would say something in the ocean is probably the most likely place to see it. I could imagine like porpoises or something like that end up ending up with something along those lines, or descendants thereof, not actually because of the porpoises. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll be slower next time. <laughs> uh, are there certain diseases that you think will be cured through genetics? Absolutely. And maybe eliminated from humanity's future. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I think that will definitely happen. I think what can happen it depends on very much. Well, there's a couple of things. There's a couple of different forces that, that come into play. So, if genetic engineering becomes more more prevalent, then in principle it would be possible to edit out some of those sorts of things. Now, there's always a danger with that, right? That there's always this sort of unforeseen. What could this lead to? Could there are there unexpected circumstances? I think what's more likely to happen, rather than actually eliminating mutation that causes the disease is finding really, really good workarounds. Like instead of cutting this thing out, we'll give you this medicine which causes your other gene over here to express way more and it makes the, it makes the effect go away. That is less controversial, so I think that is going to be the more popular way to go. I suspect we'll have a little bit of both over time, but yeah, absolutely, I think, I think genetics is going to do a lot in that case. Exactly. Absolutely. There's already ongoing studies. Uh, yep. 
France and uh, going on here where they use adenovirus vaccine exactly. in order to transfect like uh, factor eight for patients with hemophilia Absolutely. and factor nine for hemophilia. So that's something that's already been going on. Here's we were trying to do with uh, what was it? A and James. There's a in the end up leading to leukemia. higher incidence of leukemia, so that's what put things on a back burner for about ten years. Okay. Anyways, sorry. Oh, that's great. Thanks for adding to that. Answer questions? Are we on time? Or should we probably just stop in a minute or two? Yeah. I just really wanted to hold the microphone for a second. <laughs> but I do have a question. I don't have candy like uh, <laughs> my previous speakers. Uh, in, in your opinion, huh? what is your most favorite work of fiction, whether it be a book or a movie show that actually seems to adhere with what you actually do now? You know, like, like, which one seems to take the least amount of crazy... Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I take, for me personally, I take those two vectors independently, like how much I like a show and how good the science is. <laughs> I try not to make too much of... I'm perfectly... I mean, I watch Star Wars, so obviously I, I don't care about science that much. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Um, the movie, I'm sure you probably heard, I'm sure the movie The Martian it was excellent. There are a few things in there which were dead, which were clearly just dead wrong, but by and large, the way they broke things down, the way the thoughtfulness to it, it was very, very, very impressive. So that's a good recent example for that. I should probably stop because I think the next guest is coming on in just a couple of minutes. But thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. So we had a wall costume contest, and this is when I said I would announce the winner, Miss Beverly Crusher. You are the most popular. Come forth. We did a voting. We did a voting. And your friendly local cosplay superstore is going to set you up with a beautiful certificate that says that the most people voted for you, and then you have glory. It's abstract price, but still a good prize. Uh, help her fill it out for you because you didn't put your real name. Oh, okay, you can have that on there and hang it on your wall. I don't, I don't mind. First runner up, sorry, what was it? First runner up was Galaxy Girl. Second runner up was Sith Sleeping Beauty. You see, no, no, you come forth. You get a certificate of glory. Actually, I think you're the first runner up. First runner up. Sith Sleeping Beauty. She's very pretty. And then I want, I want you to take a picture of me there for a second after you get your certificate. I want where Galaxy Girl went. She has glory in the form of a paper certificate that needs to be conferred to her. Now, back to the show. All right, let's hear it for Dr. Noor one more time. And I'm going to be seeing them again up here with Kyle Hill tomorrow, and they're going to be debating the science of Star Trek versus Star Wars, so that's going to be really exciting. So please come back and um, enjoy that. Uh, so I have a couple of announcements about our next guest. Uh, so you 